Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, please tell me your name and your affiliation. Great. So thank you for having me. I'm Grace Rahmani, and I have a company called Dow Leadership. What does Dow Leadership do? So we help organizations become decentralized, and that is in two aspects. One is we help trying to figure out what governance model do I want, what kinds of incentives, token structures, those kinds of things. And the other one is the human side. We train people to have the communication skills that you can communicate in a non-hierarchical organization. The level of responsibility is very different when everybody's in this distributed organization. So we train leaders and we train the entire organization. Do you have your own specific approach in the uh, communication processes or you adopt other existing frameworks like Holacracy? Um, we actually work more on the human side. Holacracy and sociocracy, those are more like methodologies. Yes. We're actually doing mindset training mm -hmm. because you can put in a methodology, but if you still get angry and triggered all the time, or you still think, whatever, Asian people are like this, or women are like that, all those procedures don't help. So we actually do mindset training for people. And um, uh, what about those organizations that want to uh, be decentralized, not only uh, from a physical point of view, but also from a legal point of view. Uh, do you uh, believe that it is possible to go smoothly from the current state to the next one, or it's better to start with a clean slate and start uh, anew? Well, it's going to be a rocky road. <laughs> Um, I'm very interested in situations where you don't want to fork, like we want to either create a new legal entity or not create a legal entity or transition, but we don't want people to leave. And that might be a country as well. That might be a uh, standards body. We want to transition, but we don't, you know, because right now, for example, standards bodies are centralized. There's somebody who's the president of the standards bodies, but that's kind of a perfect idea of where it should be a DAO, where every member should be equal in the standards body. You shouldn't have a standards body where Google and Facebook and Microsoft get to write the rules because they've got more money. So this transition, I think, is going to be rough and legal entities, this is a very sticky problem. I'm not convinced that DAOs need legal entities. Um, a legal entity is the organization vis-a-vis -vis other organizations. And the way a DAO might look is more fluid, more like a movement. So if it's a kind of a movement, it might not need a legal entity. And the questions of liability will come up. But I think one of the biggest problems we have around legal entities is cryptocurrency was designed by design, not border bound. And it's not, and it was designed by young people who don't know about borders. You know, they're out there playing, you know, whatever, League of Legends. They don't know if the other player is from some, they don't know there's a border. And those are the people who design cryptocurrency. And so whatever we're going to have with DAOs, I think they're also going to be immune to national boundary. So self-regulation would be useful, which look might look more like certifications, you know, so. so um, you mentioned several types of organizations, yeah. uh, corporations, standards bodies, nation states, uh, and uh, each of these uh, are under pressure mm -hmm. uh, to adapt ever more rapidly to changing conditions. And they are, of course, resisting this kind of change, as well as, uh, because that is where you concentrate from the point of view of individuals, uh, um, may be correlated with age as well sometimes. The more successful you are, the more you tend to believe you do, that you don't need to embrace something that is so radically new. Um, you recognize that uh, the transition is going to be rough. Mm -hmm. Do you expect there will be breaking points, conflicts? And how do you prepare eventually uh, the, the people and the organizations you work with to face those possible conflicts? <sighs> yes, there are conflicts and some of them are very clear. So one of the biggest conflicts is that the people in power are going to have less power. So I was working with one company that had uh, raised money as an ICO. So fundamentally, the money doesn't belong to the founders and the money doesn't belong to the, you know, it belongs to the investors, but it's everybody's money. 
And when they started to decentralize, the founders had to recognize, wait a second, I signed the checks. And what's going to happen when everybody in the organization signs the checks? This is a really big difficulty for people as individuals and as organizations, who's going to be responsible. So some of these conflicts are built in, like, why should I? I've actually heard somebody told me, I was in, in one interview, he said, we did a very successful experiment with Dow Stack. It was really great. We took a limited budget and it was super successful. But then the founders were like, why would I put all the money in the Dow? I control it now. This is the fundamental conflict. Conflict And the fundamental conflict can be summarized as right now a few people have a lot of power. And we're going through a transition as humanity. The problems are caused by a few people having a lot of power, whether that's money or tanks. And in some places it'll be rougher, in some places it won't. So um, if we actually are able to implement a good solution and a good transition, in a few generations it would be fine and uh, um, the people growing up in the new status quo um, more inclusive, more egalitarian, where mm -hmm. power is more equally distributed, uh, they will take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Can we afford uh, for the process to take one, two or three generations? And if we cannot, if we must proceed uh, on a tighter schedule, uh, what are the catalysts of the mental transformation that is needed? Um, it needs to be faster because the planet is not doing so great and because poverty and all these things are just getting more and more accelerated. So the catalyst is there. You see the catalyst in Beirut, you see the catalyst in Hong Kong, you see the catalyst in Chile, you see the catalyst is here. The technology isn't ready. We don't have good frameworks. I got started on this when the Arab Spring happened. I thought, oh great, but there's no good form of governance for these people who've overthrown their government. So the catalysts have been here and it's really a question of the people being able to quickly ramp up solutions. And that's gonna involve sustainability from all the perspectives. One of the big missings for the technologists who talk about DAOs is they don't have any water, food, or electricity. If I were the Ethereum Foundation, I'd be like, let's buy a big farm with water and build some satellites and, and be completely self-sustainable. You want to build on Ethereum? Come live on our farm. We don't give you money, but you have everything you need. And only by creating these economies that are more self-sustaining are we going to have that transition. There's thousands of these all over the world. There's many um, community currencies, 6,000, 7,000 community currencies, cooperatives. It's growing. What the cryptocurrency and the DAO movement have are the technologies to connect those 6,000 currencies. And we're, we should be very much in a hurry to adopt these practices which have been practiced by these communities. They're not about getting rich, they're about being sustainable and living in harmony with one another. And it's like any evolutionary crisis, right? It goes one way or the other and it's painful. <laughs> um, the content revolution that uh, uh, the internet uh, created uh, gave power to anybody to produce uh, compelling narratives that could tell uh, stories that uh, passionately involved others mm -hmm. to be, for example, part of a movement. Yes. And this was uh, true when uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation was born and uh, all the uh, cyberpunk uh, dreams uh, were being uh, uh, created. Uh, and here we are today uh, with uh, uh, Disney and uh, Netflix and Apple happily streaming um, the 21st century um, opium in each of our homes in the centralized fashion that we didn't believe could happen again after the internet revolution. Is Libra going to be similarly the death toll of the dreams of crypto liberating people 
because the convenience of what it offers to 2 billion people all over the world will tranquilize and sedate the revolutionary aspects of what crypto could represent. Okay, so I don't know. Who knows the future? But what we sold last time, which was the key for Amazon, Netflix, and more than anybody, Google and Facebook, was our identities. The way that we created the Web2 protocol we didn't create an interoperability protocol around our identity, my ability to hold my own identity, to hold my own data, to know, so that when I sign in, I know what data I produced. And we, there were, this is why I talked about standards bodies. What happened was there were these standards bodies trying to figure out how to do that. How could everybody have a, an identity for themselves? But pretty soon, who funded the standards body? Pretty soon, whose employees had time to be on the standard bodies? It was Google, it was Facebook, it was Microsoft. And so what we sold, it wasn't, um, it wasn't about the opium that they can send us. It was about control of our data and the ability to absolutely control what we see and how we see it and the propaganda that we get. And so actually our minds are being formed by media and the media is being controlled by big companies that want money, which is, it's the only motivation. It's like, isn't there anything better you could do with all the power in the world than make more money? But there isn't, apparently. Well, uh, um, the DNA of corporations uh, uh, yes. evolved in order to maximize profit. Exactly. And they cannot stop doing it because uh, that's, that's what they are. Exactly. Um, so, but, but to answer your question, the thing we need to take back is our identity. If we're able to have self-sovereign identity, all the rest becomes possible. And if we don't have self-sovereign identity, who knows what's going to happen. Is a self-sovereign identity going to be possible without the level of resilience that you described by saying each of us have to have our source of water, source of energy, source of food, um, extending to include each of us having our own fab to produce our own microchips that we can assuredly know are not being perverted and infiltrated with code that ser serves somebody else's needs rather than our own. We know we cannot trust uh, software layers and even though uh, the various uh, articles in Bloomberg, Business Week and elsewhere of uh, chips uh, being smuggled in servers and PCs have been denied, they were extremely plausible. Yeah. So it means we not only cannot trust our software, we cannot trust even our hardware. Oh, we certainly cannot trust our hardware. So the answer is probably yes. And, and it's like everything. During the transition, a lot of the answers are yes. And if we successfully navigate a transition, I think we'll see uh, the death of large corporations. Because decentralization, there's the people that go, who's going to be the winner? Who's going to be the 800 pound gorilla? I'm like, have you seen the 800 pound gorilla? He's not more powerful than the ants. You go to the jungle, there's an 800 pound gorilla, there's ants, there's trees. The 800 pound gorilla can't boss the ants around. He can't move the trees. That's how nature works. That's how decentralization works. So I think that we will see um, a new opening of IP where everybody could print their own chips. And there'll be trusted sources of that. And there won't be 800 pound gorillas, but if the IP is all open, we could all use the best of it. Today, you can't build the best chip because this one owns that IP and this one. You know, in the future, maybe we will be able to. Um, you uh, come from the human uh, perspective yeah. in analyzing and, and building DAOs. Uh, there is a parallel um, movement and, and interest group that uh, sees uh, the DAO uh, as a very natural embodiment, organizationally speaking, of IoT and AI that should rather be organized in a decentralized fashion than not being concentrated in server farms, in the cloud, in the hands of a Google or the, the Baidu uh, of, of the next generation. 
Um, do you see an opportunity for the two to coexist and to collaborate, to improve each other? Uh, what is your view of uh, human AI collaboration in the age of DAO? Yeah. So we're already becoming cyborgs. And you don't want, you want to deny it, but it's true, right? When you first got GPS, you and I can probably remember, some people don't remember, but it would give you a few different options or you'd kind of check the map and you'd look at the, is my GPS really right? And now it tells me what to do and I don't care, right? It's making decisions for me. It's becoming part of me. Our phones, you wouldn't leave home without your phone. You'd go back for it. So we're already becoming part of these devices and they're becoming part of us. I mean, and I'm not talking about people with pacemakers or whatever, but it's inevitable that these things become part of us. When cars drive themselves, our identity is tied up in our car too. So the examples that you are giving, though, uh, are uh, complements to our existing capabilities, enhancing them, uh, but they still are centered on our uh, uh, agency. Um, my question was around the hypothetical possibility of AIs with their own agency, with their own goal sets, with their own maximization uh, functions uh, that navigate and balance their needs with our needs uh, but uh, we are not the center of that organization anymore that could potentially be the future it's interesting we have a very human-centric idea of how the future will be looking but it's true the ai and these different kinds of forms of organization may be a very big part of our future and we may be integrated with them or not um, we have this idea that somehow we're like the top of the evolutionary pyramid, but maybe AI is the next evolution. Maybe if I were Mother Earth, I'd say, you know what, I got these stewards, they called human beings, they were supposed to take good care of me, they did a crappy job, I'm going to nominate AI, and I'm going to use these humans to build the thing that's going to replace them, because as Mother Earth, the current stewards are not doing a good job. Who knows? As you are traveling around the world uh, and uh, evangelize uh, others uh, and uh, work with your clients uh, to implement your practice, um, other people uh, may come to you and say, oh, I'd love to do what you do. Are you a DAO yet? Me personally, my DAO? Well, your organization, your practice. Is it set up as a DAO? It's set up as, right now, uh, it's set up as me. I do have a number of other trainers who work with me. I have a book out that people can use, and if, you know you can get it on Amazon, or you can just ask nicely, and I'll give you the PDF for free. I think we all need to give our contribution to the open source and to the collaborative. Um, doing what I do takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of training to walk into a room of 50 or 100 people and transform them all together transform the entire culture. So I'd love to have more people do it. it and, and if you inspire others who need to learn from you, and since it takes a long time, doesn't that necessarily create a hierarchical relationship? I don't know. If you go and you go to a domo and you learn from the master, is it's kind of a different kind of hierarchy, isn't it? Like I'm going to learn from the martial arts from the master. He's the master, he's not my boss. So it's a different kind of hierarchy. Wonderful. So thank you very much for the conversation mm -hmm. and good luck with your next uh, challenges. Thank you. And uh, thank you for spreading the word about uh, decentralization and distributed organizations. Thank you. I believe you're the one spreading the word for me. So it's been my pleasure. <laughs>